I'm Archpriest Chad Hatfield, president of St. Vladimir's Orthodox Theological Seminary. And it's my great pleasure to welcome our nearly 650 virtual guests, in addition to our residential community of seminarians, their families, our esteemed faculty and committed staff. This is the 38th annual Father Alexander Schmemann lecture offered on the paternal feast of our three hierarchs chapel. 2021 is the 100th anniversary of Proto Presbyter Alexander's birth in Tallinn, Estonia. Our seminary will be keeping this centennial year with several celebrations, highlighting many areas of interest to our former dean and professor. He was a man of great depth and he expressed himself clearly. His voice is still with us today as priest, teacher, and prophet. Shortly before we hear our speaker, Rod Dreher, we will hear Father Alexander in a short clip that is classically Father Alexander and an example of just how contemporary he remains. Father Alexander had much to say about secularism in his day. In fact, a significant portion of his personal and scholarly efforts address the rise of secularism and where it might lead us culturally. Many today have forgotten that he was one of the original signers of the Hartford Appeal in 1975. This landmark document was a warning to American people about the dangers of creeping radical individualism and secularism. It is essential that everyone today understands Father Alexander's prophetic voice. That is indeed a voice for our time. To do this, I'm going to quote from a chapter that I contributed to the book, Healing Humanity, published by Holy Trinity Seminary Press, titled, The Eucharist as Antidote to Secularism. Father Alexander was convinced that despite modernity's widespread preoccupation with semantics, it was important for us to maintain our vocabulary as Orthodox Christians and to define the terms and words that we use. There is a great deal of confusion about the exact meaning of the very terms we use in this discussion, not only among Christians in general, but even among the Orthodox themselves. There exists in fact, no consensus, no commonly accepted frame of reference concerning either worship or secularism, and thus the problem of their interrelation. Therefore, my paper is an attempt not so much to solve the problem as to clarify it, and to do this, if possible, within a consistent Orthodox perspective. Father Alexander pointed to the adverse results of that confusion. Again, I quote, in my opinion, the Orthodox, when discussing the problem stemming from our present situations, accept them much too easily in their Western formulations. They do not seem to realize that the Orthodox tradition provides above all a possibility and thus a necessity of reformulating these very problems, of placing them in a context whose absence or deformation in the Western religious mind may have been the root of so many of our modern impasses and as I see it, nowhere is this task more urgently needed than in the range of problems related to secularism and proper to our so-called secular age." Unquote. That secular age is the same one in which we are living almost four decades later. Surveys in North America reveal some shocking statistics our people are not well formed in their own theological mind. Abortion, same-sex marriage, transgenderism, euthanasia, and many other vexing issues of our day are gaining increasing acceptance among Orthodox believers. So 
we cannot, as Orthodox Christians, simply sit in judgment on anybody. Our own house is in crisis, and we have to put it in order. As part of our desire for you to hear Father Alexander's own words, we're taking pre-orders for our soon-to-be-released SVS Press Volume 1, A Voice for Our Time, Radio Liberty Talks by Father Alexander Schmemann. This project has been in the works for quite some time and I'm grateful to our SVS Press staff, the two translators, Father Alexis Vinogradov and Father Nathan Williams. The introduction by Serge Schmemann sets the tone for the time of the recordings and gives us the visual of his father sitting at the microphone. The foreword written by New York Times bestselling author Rod Dreher reminds us that it might be that we Americans will need this prophet and pastor as much as the Russians once did. And with this, let me pivot from introducing the lecture and a voice for our time to introducing our 38th annual Schmemann lecture. St. Cardinal John Henry Newman in his work, Idea of a University wrote regarding authors a great author, gentlemen, is not merely one who has a copia verborum, whether in prose or verse, and can, as it were, turn on his own will any number of splendid phrases and swelling sentences. But he is one who has something to say and knows how to say it. Not everyone will agree with what Rod writes, but he does have something to say and his many books, be it How Dante Can Save Your Life, The Benedict Option, or his new bestseller, Live Not By Lies, have connected with the multitude. I have a friend of many years who owns maybe the best classical Christian bookstore in the country, who told me recently that Live Not By Lies has sold like no other book in his decades of selling books. Ignaz Solzhenitsyn has said of Live Not By Lies in this remarkable prescient book, Dreher sets Alexander Solzhenitsyn's timeless appeal to live not by lies as the cornerstone of his own bold warning. His suggestion of a dawning post-Christian pre-totalitarian society is impossible to dismiss in light of the patient case he builds for his passionate if provocative thesis. Many of us at St. Vladimir Seminary clearly saw a connection between what our speaker today mined for us to read through interviews with those who lived through the dark days of the communist yoke and the efforts of Father Alexander to speak into the Soviet Union to remind his hearers of what had been lost and yes, erased in Russian history, religion, and culture. Take time to read Rod's forward and let it prepare you to read Father Alexander and not simply hear a voice from the past, but to hear a voice for our time. Douglas Smith's book, Former People, The Final Days of the Russian Aristocracy reminds us that 100 years ago, many people failed to read the signs of the coming totalitarian state, and consequently, they suffered greatly. Many associated with this seminary over the years knew the brutality of the atheist communist era. They knew what it was to preserve a remnant of what was exterminated or living hidden underground in what was once known as Holy Mother Russia. This is an important part of our seminary's history. Through a voice of our time, we can once again connect with this history through the voice of Father Alexander. We will hear him briefly before we hear from Rod Dreher, who knows the very people that Father Alexander was hoping to reach with a message of hope. He will today in particular be speaking to future priests and lay leaders serving orthodoxy and the rest of us will be allowed the privilege of listening in. 
For I think no one can today doubt that we are in a deep crisis, not only political crisis, not only economic crisis, but first of all a spiritual crisis. So we Christians, we who confess Christ, have to, to go through that very stormy sea, waves of, of, of that sea of this world with some clear-cut principles of discerning what is right, what is wrong, what are we to do, discern the spirits. It is a spiritual discernment. And it is a spiritual discernment because what, what acts in this world are not abstract ideas or anonymous impersonal phenomena. Behind everything there is a personal, personal presence. Never be ashamed of believing, naive as it may seem to people of our age, never stop believing that the battle is in, in this world, the struggle is not uh, between structures and systems, political or economic, people like that idea. No, struggle is personal. It is the spirit of God, it is the spirit of evil. From that point of view, difficult as it may seem for us to understand, every personal victory on evil, maybe even unknown to the world, has an impact on the whole situation. A saint leaves the world, lives somewhere else, no one knows about him, but he is participating in that great struggle which will be going on until the end of the world. It's a great honor to be here with you, even if it's only over Zoom. I'd like to thank Father Chad Hatfield for his invitation to give this lecture and to thank him, the board of the seminary and Metropolitan TCON for supporting my speaking here. I would also like to thank my Orthodox Christian brothers and sisters who tried to get me deplatformed. You all inadvertently helped make my case in this lecture and in that you have been a blessing to my work. This is the 38th annual Schmemann Lecture, and I'm told the beginning of several events that will mark the 100th anniversary of his birth. I'm honored to be included in this centenary celebration. And the words we just heard from Father Alexander are so, uh, so prescient and so applicable to our time. We do live in a dangerous, confusing, and difficult time. We're not only living through the dechristianization of our civilization, but we're also facing what I firmly believe will be an extended period of contempt for traditional Christianity within our society and even persecution. I would like to address my remarks today in particular to the seminarians of St. Vladimir's Orthodox Theological Seminary because it is you who will lead the church through this trial. It is you who will prepare your congregations to suffer faithfully and courageously as Orthodox Christian men and women. You are the generation that will lay the groundwork for the survival of the Orthodox Christian faith. And God willing, after the cold, dark winter recedes, the seeds that you will plant will experience a new birth of Christian flourishing in our land. Let's begin today by going back to the spring of 2015 when I received a phone call from a doctor. He reached out to me through a mutual friend because something extraordinary had happened and he felt that he had to share it with a journalist. This doctor's elderly mother was an immigrant to America from Czechoslovakia. Watching the news here in America about a cancel culture mob that forced the shutdown of a Christian business in the Midwest, the old woman told her son that the things she sees happening in America now remind her of what it was like when communism first came to her home country. Now, these weren't empty words. In the 1950s, as a young Catholic, this woman spent four years in a communist prison on charges of being a Vatican spy, this because she refused to stop meeting with her church prayer group. Well, when I heard that, I thought the old woman was being alarmist. But after that call, I made a point whenever I traveled around the country to lectures and conferences and would meet people who had grown up under communism but who had immigrated to America, I would ask them if they were seeing things today that reminded them of what they left behind. Every single one of them said yes. 
And if you talk to them long enough, you would discover that many of them were quite angry with their fellow Americans for not taking them seriously. Americans, they would tell me, think that things like this can't happen in their country, and they're going to find out the hard way. Well, that was the genesis for my book, Live Not By Lies. I wanted to discover what it was precisely about contemporary American life that had so rattled these survivors of communism. And I wanted to travel to Russia and the former Soviet bloc countries of Eastern Europe to interview Christians who dissented back in the day to find out from them what we American Christians must know if we're going to endure what's coming. I dedicated my book to a heroic Catholic priest who foresaw what was coming and prepared his people. In 1943, this priest showed up in Bratislava, the capital of the Slovak region, fleeing Nazi agents in his native Croatia. This priest, now calling himself Tomislav Kolakovic, to evade discovery, took a teaching position in the city's Catholic University and began to organize the students. He told them that the good news was the Germans were going to lose this war. The bad news was that the communists were going to be ruling the country after the war was over, and the first people they were going to come after were those in the church. Father Kolakovic set out to make Slovak Christians ready. He methodically organized groups of young Catholics for prayer, study, and action. While the Kolakovic's groups spread all over the Slovak region within two or three years and formed a network. Now, the Slovak bishops were not keen on Father Kolakovic's work. For one thing, they thought he was an alarmist, that he was scaring people for no reason. But that did not stop Father Kolakovic. He knew that the wishful thinking of the bishops would leave the church vulnerable to persecution. And he also knew that as soon as the communists took power, they would come after the clergy, first of all. The survival of Christianity in that country would depend on building a resilient network. Well, it all happened exactly as Father Kolakovic said. His network became the backbone of the underground church there after the Iron Curtain fell, and it was the only organized opposition to the communist regime for its entire 40-year existence. Today, I want to tell you what forms this new totalitarianism is taking in our country. Now, it's not going to be Stalinism 2.0, let me assure you, and that's why so few of us recognize the danger. And I want to tell you what I learned from these Christian confessors, Orthodox, Catholic, and Protestant, who kept the faith under communist persecution. Finally, I want to share with you the kind of Christians we all must be as priests and as laity if we are to preserve the faith through the difficult trials ahead. I believe that we are in another Kolakovic moment, a time when we American Christians must clearly see what is to come and use the liberties we have to make ourselves ready. What is totalitarianism? The word brings to mind gulags, secret police, and all the things we associate with the Soviet world and with George Orwell's 1984. The word though was actually coined by the Italian fascist dictator, Benito Mussolini. It is an extreme form of authoritarianism in which not only is political authority monopolized, but also every single thing in society is politicized. Mussolini's slogan was, everything within the state, nothing outside the state, nothing against the state. Totalitarianism even seeks to control people's ideas about reality itself. Now, in theory, you can have totalitarianism within a liberal democracy. The Italian political theorist Augusto del Noce saw in the 1960s that the sexual revolution manifested totalitarian tendencies. What made it totalitarian was the complete subjection of culture to politics. In this case, the politics of sexual freedom, which tolerated nothing that stood in opposition to its claims. Indeed, in Del Noche's time, the sexual revolutionaries insisted that anyone who disagreed with them was a bigot who could not be reasoned with, only conquered. Well, in the early 1950s, in the wake of a world war that destroyed one totalitarianism, the National Socialist version, and left communist totalitarianism governing half the world, the scholar Hannah Arendt wrote an important book in which she sought to discern the origins of the totalitarian phenomenon. 
what are the signs of a pre-totalitarian society? Well, first and foremost, according to Arendt, a pre-totalitarian society is a lonely society. It's a society that is filled with people who are alienated from their traditions, from religion, and from the things that give life meaning and purpose. Does this sound like any society you know? Second, a pre-totalitarian society is one that has lost faith in hierarchies and institutions. It is also a society that desires to transgress and destroy. Casting down barriers, both literal, as in the case of the US Capitol recently, and abstract, as for example, in the erasure of the gender binary. A pre-totalitarian society is one in which people cease to care about the truth. They prefer to believe lies, including things that they have every reason to believe are lies, things that make them feel good and that give them a sense of meaning. Whether it's the crude conspiracy theories on the right or left-wing revisionist histories that serve an ideological purpose, a people that ceases to care about the truth is one that believes these lies and that makes itself therefore ready to accept totalitarianism. All of these things are happening right here, right now in America. Now this does not mean that we are fated to become totalitarian. It does mean though that the American people are preparing themselves to accept it if the right offer comes along. Now, I have to confess that in, until the post-election mess culminating in the appalling attack on the U.S. Capitol on January the 6th, I had not taken the pre-totalitarian sentiments on the political right seriously enough. I did not understand what a big deal QAnon and adjacent political extremism was until I started to hear from Orthodox friends around the country after the election about how it was dividing their parishes. And then, of course, came the January 6th attack. I was wrong about that, and I intend to learn from my mistake. But I paid more attention to the incipient totalitarianism on the left because I believed then, and I continue to believe, that it is the graver threat because the left's ideology controls nearly all of the institutions of power in American society. And because as the sociologist James Davison Hunter puts it, elite networks and elite institutions are the key actors in history. A revolutionary idea might emerge from the masses, but it usually does not gain traction until it is embraced and propagated by elites through their networks and institutions. This was true of the Bolshevik revolution, and it is true of the cultural revolution that is moving swiftly through America today. The ruling elite of the United States is broadly speaking on the cultural left. This has been the case for quite some time now. The news and entertainment media, the universities, the important cultural institutions, some of our churches, and of course the Democratic Party, all of them are thoroughly dominated by the cultural left and its values. What's new is the cultural left has conquered corporate America and the professions, including law and medicine. Americans who are still operating in a Reagan era mindset in which big business is somehow conservative need to familiarize themselves with the concept of woke capitalism. The left uses its institutional and network power to enforce rigid norms of behavior and discourse in line with current progressive ideals. These ideals concentrate on sexual freedom, including abortion rights, homosexuality, and transgender ideology, and on racial identity politics. It's chilling to read the literature of the early Soviet era and to see how the Bolsheviks divided people by social class and judged them not as individuals, but as members of a group bearing group identity and group guilt. Well, the same logic is now operating in America, but our progressives use race, sexual and gender identity and other markers of so-called victim status to separate the sheep from the goats. The late scholar and cultural critic Rene Girard warned at the turn of this century that an ideology of antichrist was arising on the left, seizing Christianity's traditional concern for victims and turning it against the church. Gerard said, and I quote, the current process of spiritual demagoguery and rhetorical overkill has transformed the concern for victims into a totalitarian command and a permanent inquisition. We are living through a caricatural 
ultra-Christianity that tries to escape from the Judeo-Christian orbit by radicalizing the concern for victims in an anti-Christian manner. The intellectuals and other elite, cultural elites, have promoted Christianity to the role of number one scapegoat." Close quote. But this is what survivors of communism feel in their bones, even if they can't yet articulate it. We can see these effects of the, the would-be totalitarians in cancel culture. A Hungarian and a Russian both told me at different times that it always starts with people being forced out of their jobs for ideological reasons. We see that happening everywhere now, and it's going to pick up. We also see cancel culture at work when people are forbidden to say certain things or at risk of losing their livelihoods. Both Alexander Solzhenitsyn and Václav Havel, the leader of the Czech Velvet Revolution, said that the entire communist system was upheld by lies and by people being too afraid to speak the truth. We are building the same kind of system here in America right now. Perhaps the major difference between Soviet totalitarianism and whatever is coming to be here is the role that technology plays. Stalin could only have dreamed of having the surveillance technology that exists today. There is nothing that we can say, write, or communicate electronically that is not captured by US intelligence and stored away, awaiting search and mining by artificial intelligence. This is not a conspiracy theory. Edward Snowden revealed this eight years ago. Moreover, and this is crucial, the power to surveil does not belong solely to the state. Major corporations surveil us constantly through our laptops and smartphones, through all smart devices, really. In Prague, one dissident told me that she cannot understand why so many people today are so free with their personal data. We are giving to our enemies the data that they need to destroy us, she said. She even told me that people today, young people in her country and certainly Americans think that it doesn't matter that corporations and others can collect this data because we're not gonna do anything bad anyway. My friend, the dissident whose husband went to prison for opposing the government said, it doesn't matter if you think you're gonna do anything good or bad. If they want to pin something on you, you've given them the data with which to do it. The future of our country, I fear, is China with its social credit system. The Chinese have built the most awesome surveillance state in human history. They monitor each and every citizen constantly by tracking their every move online. The country's very wired. Each Chinese citizen has what they call a social credit rating. It's a score that the government gives you based on whether or not you are a model citizen. A model citizen, by the government's reckoning, gets a higher social credit rating. This allows him to have certain privileges. Nonconformists, though, including people who go to church, get low social credit scores and find themselves pushed to the margins of society, helpless. This is how China can compel, compel obedience from its people without sending the police around. But look, in America, we already have the technology to institute a rudimentary social credit system here. If people had to worry that everything they said online, the churches they attended, the websites they visited, the things they bought, the places they went tracked by GPS, and even the people they hung out with, if that, that that was all being recorded, assessed by artificial intelligence, and resulting in a social credit score that determined where they could go, what they could do, what kind of jobs they could have, well, it would be pretty easy to achieve total domination without having to build gulags, torture dissidents, or equip a vast police force. The whole country would be one big safe space where all dissent is suppressed in the name of compassion and social justice. This is soft totalitarianism. And this, the survivors of communism have convinced me, is what's coming. We cannot afford to assume that somehow America will avoid this calamity. Solzhenitsyn warned that what happened in Russia could happen anywhere on earth under the right conditions. So even as we pray and work to keep this hope, uh, keep this cup from passing us, to make this cup pass us, we should recognize that we are living in a Kolokovich moment. We should see the threats on the horizon and prepare ourselves, our families, our parishes, and those around us to endure what may be coming. So how do we do that? 
There are several strategies I discerned from my reading of dissident literature and my interviews with Christian dissidents in the former Soviet bloc. The two most important ones are these. First, value truth over everything. You have to have a fundamental orientation towards life that prizes truth. Live not by lies, said Solzhenitsyn. By this, he meant that one should never lower oneself to accept lies or even appear to accept lies for the sake of getting along in society and avoiding trouble. Nobody wants to hear this in America, but we have to accept that we cannot allow ourselves as Christians to be part of certain professions or societies or activities because to do so would require us to lie. We have to take for granted that in post-Christian America, faithful Orthodox Christians will always be outsiders. The only way we will find the strength to withstand what's coming will be through total commitment to Christ in the church. This is a purification. The half-hearted who do not want the full truth of Jesus Christ will be burned away. The second major lesson I learned from the dissidents is learn to receive suffering for truth as a gift. This I discovered was key to everything that the underground church and the Christian dissidents did. They reconciled themselves to a life of hardship for the sake of Christ. This was the only way they got through it. Jesus did not call admirers, he called disciples. You can only tell who was an admirer and who was a disciple when they've been tested by suffering. A Hungarian Christian dissident told me, quote, suffering is a part of every human's life. We don't know why we suffer, but your suffering is like a seal. If you put that seal on your actions, interestingly enough, people start to wonder about your truth, that maybe you're right about God. In one sense, she said, it's a mystery because the evil one wants to persuade us that there is a life without suffering. First, you have to live through it, and then you have to try to pass on the value of suffering because suffering has a value, unquote. Everything in this culture of hedonism and comfort testifies that suffering is always evil. Suffering is something we should always seek to avoid. And this is why so many Christians today will ultimately capitulate to the world. If we have not catechized ourselves about the gift of suffering and the blessing of persecution, we're going to capitulate too. I have something else to tell you about living not by lies. You've heard it said that we in the Orthodox Church need to learn to be more open-minded, to compromise with the modern world, that the Church needs to cast aside her fidelity to the Bible's teachings on human sexuality and the family, and to disregard or alter or change her traditions, that we have to accommodate to the world in the name of compassion. We have to be relevant to the world. Well, about relevance, I think of something Father Alexander Schmemann wrote in his journal, he lamented that the Russian church in his era was lost in nostalgia for the past and did not notice that the world had changed, that history was on the move. He was right to lament that. It's absolutely vital that we Orthodox remain true to our faith's teachings, liturgies, and traditions, but if that fidelity mires us in an escapist dream world of nostalgia, then it is a misleading and a harmful thing. On the other hand, if the admirable desire to make the faith attractive to people of this time and place causes us to abandon our soft pedal core teachings, truths that must never be up for dialogue, then that's a bad thing. If some conservatives within the Orthodox Church are paralyzed by nostalgia for the past, then some progressives within the Orthodox Church are hostage to nostalgia for the future. They want to build a 21st century American version of what the Bolsheviks called a living church one that accommodates itself to the spirit of the age. This would in fact be a zombie church that would die because it would serve no purpose other than to be Caesar's chaplaincy. Ask any Orthodox you know who found Orthodoxy while escaping from the ruins of mainline Protestantism. They know where this kind of thing leads. Do not allow yourselves to fall for what the neo-renovationists of the living or the living churchmen among us call dialogue about the future of orthodoxy. This is a trap that the small O orthodox parties within other churches know very well. It is a strategy to exhaust the traditionalists, the orthodox, until they surrender to the neo-renovationists. In every church where neo-renovations take power, the dialogue ends at that point. Let me be even more specific and blunt. 
there's a reason why LGBT issues are the chief wedge cleaving the American churches apart. It ultimately has to do with anthropology. That is the question, what is man? The Bible tells us one thing, the modern world tells us another. The modern self understands itself as self-defined, untethered by any connection to a cosmological or metaphysical framework. The self is defined by its own desires. Now from this ideal to deny the self what it wants is to insist on disorder, which is to say injustice. Well, it should be obvious why faithful Christians cannot agree with this, especially when this false anthropology seeks to overthrow the church's teachings on human sexuality. We cannot have a meaningful dialogue with our contemporary renovationists because we start from different anthropological suppositions and maybe even different metaphysical ones. No doubt about it, we Orthodox can and should talk about how to best present the traditional teaching in the modern post-Christian world. But about the truth and the binding authority of this teaching, there can be no dialogue if by dialogue, one means a dialectical process that results in a synthesis of both parts. A synthesis of truth and falsehood is still falsehood. Even if the poison has been cut by sweet, delicious Kool-Aid, it will still kill you. But the false anthropology of expressive individualism, the idea that we are who we choose to be, bound by nothing unchosen, presents us with a broader and deeper problem. The sociologist of religion, Christian Smith, has documented how extensively, uh, how American Christians under the age of 40 have been formed, not according to Christian tradition, but by the post-Christian culture. They have assimilated Christianity into the framework of expressive individualism. We have to understand that young people today, and in fact, all Christians, or most Christians of at least the last 50 years, have been catechized and discipled by a cultural vision that places the sovereign self at the center of their understanding. Now, this has been at the heart of the human story since Adam and Eve, but today we have built a post-Christian cultural matrix that calls self-worship good. Since the tumult of the 1960s, modern churches and modern families have done, frankly, a terrible job of recognizing the radical challenge to Christianity from late modernity. Now, I bring this up because you seminarians will not only be responsible for forming and discipling a community in the face of outside persecution, but you will also have to wage an intense internal struggle to deprogram your congregation from the false beliefs of post-Christian culture. You cannot fight something with nothing. And the harsh truth is that relatively few of us American Christians have the kind of doctrinal knowledge and habits of discipleship that give us what we need to resist this post-Christian juggernaut. God gives the church in every age the saints it needs. You men and women will need to be a combination of Solzhenitsyn and St. Benedict. You will need to be thundering prophets who say no to lies and who are prepared to suffer for the sake of the truth. And you, you who are be, to be ordained, you men who are to be ordained, will also need to be loving fathers who teach and guide your parish into a disciplined and resilient communal life of faith, charity, and repentance. The kind of Christians who will still be Christian in 50 years are those who have been prepared to suffer for the faith in ways both small and big. They will be the kind of Christians who see in their religion truth claims that can withstand rejection by popular culture and even persecution. They will be the kind of Christians who attend churches that demand something of them. They will be the kind of Christians who don't compartmentalize their faith, taking religion out only for Sundays and holidays, but rather who incorporate it into their daily lives. They will be the kind of Christians who don't compromise on truth because they believe, but who also don't compromise on mercy because they love. This is the orthodox way. Solzhenitsyn said that the catastrophe of communism came upon Russia because men had forgotten God. Our present and coming catastrophe here in America is upon us because men have forgotten God. Your great mission and calling and the mission and calling of every single Orthodox Christian is to be the means through which God resurrects himself in the, in the darkened minds and cramped lives of modern men. What an awesome privilege. Our civilization is going through a long Lent 
but let us approach the crisis with the understanding that we are living in a time of bright sadness. In his wonderful book about Great Lent, Father Schmemann writes that the bright sadness of Lent transforms us if we allow it to. He writes that it is, quote, as, is as if we were reaching a place to which the noises and fuss of life of the street, of all that which usually fills our days and even nights, have no access, a place where they have no power. All that which seems so tremendously important to us as to fill our mind, that state of anxiety which has virtually become our second nature, disappears somewhere. and We begin to feel free, light, and happy." Unquote. Here we enter into one of the profoundest mysteries of our faith. This is the transformative power of the powerless. In my book, Live Not By Lies, I tell the story of Timo Krishka, a young Slovak Catholic who was only a toddler when communism ended. He made a name for himself as a talented photographer and filmmaker, and he has enjoyed freedom and material success in ways that his parents' and grandparents' generation under communism could only have dreamed of. Well, a few years ago, Timo began a project to photograph and interview elderly Catholics in his country who had served time in prison for their faith under the communist. Many of these people were living out their old age in poverty. Speaking to these people though, and making their portraits, their photographic portraits, converted this young man who had never known communism. Timo heard them testify again and again that having suffered for Christ in prison turned out to be among the most joyful times of their lives. Why? Because everything was torn away from them. All they had was Jesus Christ. And that was when they knew finally who they were and who he was. Timo told me, this is a quote, it seemed that the less they were able to change the world around them, the stronger they had become. These people completely changed my understanding of freedom. My project changed from looking for victims to finding heroes. I stopped building a monument to the unjust past and I began to look for a message for us, the free people. Well, the message Timo found was this, that the secular liberal idea of freedom so popular in the West and among many in his post-communist generation is a lie. That is the concept that real freedom is found by liberating the self from all binding commitments to God, to marriage, to family, and by increasing worldly comforts, that is a road that leads to hell. Krishka observed that the only force in society standing in the middle of that wide road yelling stop were the traditional Christian churches. And then it hit him. Under communism, his parents and grandparents were told that Christianity was the enemy, that Christianity was a thing that stood between them and having a better life. It was a lie. Today, under consumerist liberal democracy, his generation, our generations, are told that Christianity is the thing that stands between us and having a better life. It is still a lie. The secret Timo Krieska discovered was the same thing that Solzhenitsyn learned in the Gulag and that Christian dissidents of the Soviet period have to teach us today. Accepting suffering is the beginning of our liberation. Not just the liberation from some totalitarian future, soft or hard, but liberation from the current dictatorship of the self and its tyrannical passions. Timo told me, suffering can be a, a, the source of great strength. It gives us the power to resist. It is a gift from God that invites us to change. Well, in the world now taking shape around us, fidelity to Christ is going to bring us heavy crosses. We have to learn to regard this not as a bug, but as a feature. The dissident Slovak physician, Sylvester Kuchmeri, one of the organizers of the Christian underground in his country, wrote later that he entered prison with the mindset that he was God's probe, that his mission was to bear witness, to serve Christ, to help others, and to repent. That was what kept him from breaking under a decade of torture and confinement, and that will save us too. Similarly, the Russian Orthodox dissident Alexander Ogorodnikov told me that when he was in the depths of despair in the gulag and beginning to doubt God's providence, the Lord sent him an angel to give him visions each night of the prisoners who were executed by the communists, but who were going to be with Christ in eternity because Ogorodnikov had been there with them in the depths of their suffering to witness to Christ. Sitting across from Alexander Ogorodnikov in the lobby of the Hotel Metropole in Moscow, 
I saw a tear roll down that old man's cheek, which is still partially paralyzed from the beatings he suffered in prison. That man's tear is one of the most beautiful things I have ever seen. His radical faith that whatever he suffered for the love of Christ was not in vain, that too will save us, come what may. The world today either wants us to abandon Christianity or to substitute a very modern Christianity without tears, which amounts to the same thing. Parishes that live the true faith, though, will be a beacon in the night to those who long for Jesus Christ. These are parishes that don't give themselves over to cultural fads or to the politics of the left or the right, but which seek nothing but unity with Christ, no matter what it costs. People who live in a society that has forgotten God will be lost, lonely, and tempest-tossed. These parishes and the believers who worship within them at great cost will be the lighthouses that call the frightened, the confused, and the lonely to safe harbor. In Moscow of the early 1970s, it was all but impossible to create these communities within parish churches. The KGB was just too, too, uh, too hard on them. But that's why a small group of young people disillusioned with the false promises of communism would come together in private homes to worship Jesus. That same Alexander Ogorodnikov I mentioned a moment ago he was once a celebrated young pioneer in the communist youth movement, but he renounced all of that for Christ and became the leader of this small group. A man named Viktor Popkov was a disillusioned atheist at that time, also searching for truth in the sterile ruin of the Brezhnev years. He saw in Ogorodnikov and his circle of young believers the light of Christian hope. Now, if you came to these meetings in Moscow, Viktor Popkov told me a couple of years ago, you knew that you were inviting the KGB to pressure your parents and teachers to dissuade you from the Christian faith. This was a really hard thing to deal with, he told me, but he also said, quote, at the same time, you gain experience of a different life. And this experience of faith and this encounter with Christ, you receive a new feeling, and you know that you would not go back to how you used to be for anything. You are willing to endure anything they throw at you. You can't really prepare for it, he went on. To have a living connection to Christ, it's like falling in love. You suddenly feel something you haven't felt before, and you're ready to do something you've never done before, close quote. Well, Viktor Popkov paid for his fidelity with a prison sentence, but that only made him more firm. He told me as we sat at a kitchen table in Moscow, quote, maybe this will sound strong, but the principles and the things that you confess you need to be ready to die for them. And only then will you have the strength to resist. I don't see any other way, he said. Well, this, my brothers and sisters in Christ, is the good news. To be called to lose everything, your wealth, your liberty, your job, even your life for Christ. That really is the good news. Now, that's foolishness to modern people, even to many modern Orthodox Christians. But it is the testimony of our Savior's life. It is the testimony of the martyrs, and it is the testimony of the confessors of the Bolshevik yoke. Hear it, believe it, preach it, live it. Thank you for listening. I think we're going to have a few questions and answers now, are we not, Father Chad? There. Father Chad, there you are. I'm unmuted now. Thank you so very much, uh, Rod. You 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 absolutely hit hit the main reason that many of us here, uh, knowing the manuscript for "Live Not by Lies" and what we were working on with this project, a voice for our time with Father Schmemann, that they dovetail so nicely. Um, and again, you captured uh, the essence of Father Alexander, but you also did what Father Alexander was doing in his time, which was he was giving us warnings, he was giving us signals, and we need to wake up and pay attention. So you addressed your, your lecture this year to the seminarians, and you did it very well in laying out what those of us who are privileged to uh, have a hand in the formation of the next generation of priests and lay leaders. 
uh, in the Orthodox Church, not just simply here in America, but literally around the world, they've uh, put forward some questions. Uh, so it's their Schmemann lecture this year. So I apologize to other people who would like to have submitted some questions, but this year uh, the focus was on the seminary. And so the questions that I'm gonna present are coming from them. This is the first one. How should we respond to the workplace regarding matters concerning abortion, gay marriage, transgenderism, etc.? Is it wrong to stay silent to avoid losing our jobs and supporting our family? How do we discern when to keep silent and when to speak? Hmm. That's a very important question and a very difficult question because there really aren't any clear answers that apply strictly in every single case. These things require discernment and not just individual discernment, but discernment with your spiritual father. But I can offer a few thoughts. First, we have to be prudent. You're not required to say what you think about everything at all times. It's not cowardly to avoid talking about issues in the workplace. You know, it's just common sense. You don't talk about these things where there might be, you might cause discord. And uh, in Live Not By Lies, I tell the story of a Hungarian man who in Budapest back in the communist era, he let his passions overcome him and he trashed uh, a display at a trade fair, he trashed an image of the Romanian dictator Nicolae Ceausescu uh, because he was outraged, the, the man was, over Ceausescu's treatment of ethnic Hungarians in Romania. Well, the Hungarian communist government threw this man in prison and destroyed his mind through electroshock treatment drove him to insanity. The man was released, but he was never able to work again. His family was completely destroyed. I know about this because I interviewed the man's daughter in her apartment in Budapest. The price that that family paid for their father's rash action was severe and pointless. So we don't want to do that. You have to be prudent. But what happens when you're in a workplace that wants to compel you to say things that you don't believe are true? When I was in Poland interviewing people there for the book, I, I talk to Christians, Polish Christians who work for Polish branches of US multinational, US based multinational corporations. Now they told me that the corporate culture there as in America strongly promotes LGBT pride. They feel as Catholics that their consciences are being violated, but these are great jobs. Jobs are hard to come by. Uh, they have families to support. They asked me, what should they do? Well, in my view, and Solzhenitsyn might not agree, I think it's generally permitted to sit through things like diversity training as long as you are not required to positively affirm something you believe is false. But having to say something that you, that you believe something that's untrue, well, that's a pretty bright red line. Uh, and things are complicated when you have people depending on you as the questioner indicated. I think a smart strategy all of us can develop uh, is something suggested to me years ago by a friend of mine here in the US, a Catholic, a traditionalist Catholic who works very high up in management at a multinational uh, corporation. He has working under him uh, uh, gay and lesbian employees who are great employees. He says he treats them fairly, would dream of treating them anything but fairly, but he keeps his, his views as a traditional Catholic to himself. He told me that he thinks that one day, sooner or later, human resources is gonna to come to him and ask why he doesn't fly the pride flag in his office during pride month. Pride month. And he's gonna to have to tell them then. What he has done to prepare for that day, because he expects he'll be fired, is to, he got a real estate license so he could have a second career if he had to give up the job he loves because of his faith. I, I think that that could be a smart strategy for many of us, especially if we work in professions where we are likely to face these choices, is to come up with a plan B. I think the thing we have to be careful about though is to avoid rationalization. I write in Live Not By Lies about something that the, the Polish dissident Czesław Miłosz uh, called Ketman, a strategy to, uh, to, be, uh, to be hypocritical in the workplace, to pretend that you believe something so you can avoid trouble when in fact you really don't. People who practice Ketman think they're getting away with something. The, pro the trouble is if you practice enough Ketman, speaking a lie in the workplace to protect yourself, you eventually become the role you play. And uh, as Mivos said, the devil, you're not fooling him. He knows exactly what you're doing. So uh, I, that's, those are my thoughts about it. But I, again, don't look for, uh, for 10 rules for discerning this sort of thing. It's going to require, um, work talking to your priest and, and others you value, whose opinions you value 
in each case. Rod, this one has just come in. It's a long one, but I think it's a good one. Uh, the question is, I've been particularly inspired by the Benedict option and now what I consider to be its companion, live not by lies. As the church's prophetic voice within the public square seems to be diminishing, I remain convinced that the church's prophetic voice can perhaps be even more boldly proclaimed, not by what we say, but by how we live. And without putting words in your mouth, I think that is the overarching thesis of your body of work over the course of the last few years. For those in vocational ministry, I think our great challenge is to cultivate very intentional communities, both for the purpose of retention and evangelism. Unfortunately, for many Orthodox parishioners, their relationship to the church is primarily transactional. Moreover, we seminarians will be going into these communities upon graduation and or ordination. And while I find movements such as the Bruderhof and Roman Catholic lay monasticism particularly inspiring, they each come with a high barrier to entry. Thus, what are some useful thoughts on how to start becoming an intentional community beyond traditional program-based activities? In other words, how do we begin building our rich life together especially considering that we will mostly be going into established communities? Mm. That's a really important question. Um, you know, I, I think back in, in my book, The Benedict Option, I highlighted a Catholic community in a town called San Benedetto del Tronto in Italy. These are all Catholic lay people who are you know, what we call Orthodox Catholics, meaning they really believe that what the Catholic Church teaches is true. They started this outside community, uh, not in, as a substitute for their parishes, but rather because they couldn't get anything going in their parishes that was giving them uh, spiritual meat. And uh, they still all go to church at their parishes, but they, they have meet, prayer meetings together outside, and they, they do a lot of things together. They started a school, and this has been something that has been adjacent to parish life but has really strengthened them. And, and when you go see these people, uh, you should go meet them. They're the most joyful Christians you've ever seen, but they have a really thick community. It's a community of shared belief. This ought to be possible in churches, but for reasons the, uh, the, the questioner just mentioned, it's, it's not. Uh, we, and, and this is not only true for Catholics, but Protestants and Orthodox people too. I think one thing we can do though is encourage, uh, in the same way that Father Kolakovich did, encourage lay people who really believe, who share the beliefs of the church to take leadership roles. It shouldn't all be on the backs of the priest to do this. Nobody should do anything in opposition to what the priest says, but you know, there are many gifts that all of us have to bring that can help form these kind of communities, but they have to be communities of shared belief, shared practice too, but also shared belief. And I found that uh, so many American Christians uh, believe that when they come to church, that they're bringing their individual selves there and they have the right to pick and choose what they believe. That will never work. That's why we have so much, uh, there's so much dissent and, there's, and you can't get anything really going in a, in a church. And the pastor is trying so hard not to offend anybody that he doesn't inspire anybody. I would say, though, that one good thing we can do, one uh, practice I learned from reading the history of the, of the dissonant church, is what they did in uh, many communist countries, I'm thinking especially of Czechoslovakia, they would come together, lay people, to have meetings, to, to read books, and to hear lectures about history, about literature, about art, about culture. And the they did this specifically because, first of all, political lecture would get them in trouble. But communism, as all totalitarianism, depends for its success on making people forget their inherited culture. We're seeing this happen here in America today when so much of, uh, of our culture, not only history here in America, but Western civilization is being demonized as bigoted and oppressive and, and all that. It is going to be so important that we take responsibilities ourselves as individual Christians and in parishes to teach our kids about our cultural heritage. Uh, and this, these are things that can happen in reading groups um, and film nights. I, I write in the book about the Benda family, this Catholic family in Prague, who the mom and dad taught their children what it meant to be 
brave and courageous and faithful by showing them movies that they could still get under communism. The movie High Noon was a favorite of this family because it showed what it meant to be brave and stand against the crowd. Uh, and the, they also read the same family, read Tolkien to their children. And I asked the mom, I said, why did you read them Tolkien? She said, well, because we all knew that Mordor was real. And she said, we needed to, to help our kids. They couldn't understand the complexity of what was happening in the communist, the struggle we were in, but they could understand the fellowship of the ring and what they were, they were banding together to fight. These things are ways we can reach not only ourselves as adults, but also our children, but it has to be consistent. And uh, I think we have to be what Pope Benedict XVI said, are creative minorities. We are a minority now in this country as, as believing Christians, uh, but that, that doesn't mean that we should throw up our hands and give up, but it means that we have to get really creative in building these ways to bind community together. This last year has been horrible, of course, with COVID because of that, because many of us can't even meet, or if we meet, we have to meet under uh, strong restrictions. But um, that should help us understand how important it is when we can meet again to be much more intentional about building community. Right, that's a good segue into this next question. And you may have actually already answered it, but the question is, in your work for the Benedict Option in Live Not By Lies, have you found specific reasons why so many Christians are so resistant to taking responsibility for education of themselves and their children, but especially their children? Because it's hard. It's really hard to do. Um, in talking to headmasters at Christian schools and not, uh, not uh, confined to any particular denomination, they all end up saying one way or the other that parents are trying to outsource the moral formation of their children to the schools and to the churches. Well, Christian schools are great. Churches are of course indispensable, but a church and its staff, its pastor and its staff and a Christian school can't do what they're supposed to do unless parents are one leg of the stool. You know, they has, it has to be working together in harmony. And uh, I, I think that this is one reason so many parents are afraid to tell their kids they can't have smartphones. My gosh, when I go traveling around to speak at Christian colleges and talk to um, uh, campus ministers and professors about what are the biggest problems they're seeing in their students, one of the major ones, uh, the major one is always pornography. And, uh, and it comes, it, it always gets started usually with kids having access to smartphones. It is breathtaking to me to think that there's so many parents who know this. This is not hidden knowledge. We know this, but parents just seem to make some have some cognitive dissonance between allowing their kids to have maximum exposure to technology and what's what this is actually doing to their kids, because it's difficult. We as parents have got to be uh, much, much more willing to work harder to protect our kids, not only protect them from what's bad, but build up in them what's good. Camilla Bendova, the woman I was telling you earlier in Prague, this was a lady who was also a university professor. Her husband, Václav, was sent to prison for his dissident activities. And she had, to, had a job, she had a job, a teaching job to keep the family together. Despite all that, she came home every night and read for two hours to her children because she knew there was no other choice. Well, we, have, we don't have things nearly as badly as she did, but there is no other choice but for us as parents to take that responsibility on. Um, the, the alternative is to lose our kids. The next question here is, how do you have a civil conversation with people who disagree with you and possibly might even despise you for your opinions? What is your criteria for choosing when to engage and when to ignore? He's asking me? <laughs> um, well, I, I think that's a great question. I only engage with people uh, whom I believe are engaging me in good faith. By, by, mean, by which I mean, I think they're coming to me with an open mind and will respect what I say. They really wanna know what I say, even if they disagree with me. And I treat them the same way because uh, I want to learn from them too. You know, but if I think that we can never find understanding or agreement, then I just don't waste my time. You know, I'll be honest here. Some time ago, the people at Public Orthodoxy and Orthodoxy and Dialogue asked me to participate in their discussions. 
I wouldn't do it, even though we could probably agree on a lot of things. But the thing that we most sharply disagree on, the role of sexual orientation and gender identity, what orthodoxy should say about it, that's an issue on which I don't think we can possibly agree. Now, I might be wrong about that, but I don't think I am. And as I mentioned in the talk, uh, it's been my long experience watching the way these dialogues go in Catholic and Protestant circles, that dialogue, quote unquote dialogue, is usually a strategy for wearing down traditionalists. It's not really what it appears to be, uh, an exchange of ideas. And personally, I don't grant legitimacy to a point standing to a point of view that is tearing apart other churches. And that will do the same thing to us if we give it the space in which to do it. So short answer is, if I think somebody's coming to me sincerely seeking uh, dialogue, I'll talk to them. But if they're just trolling me, if they just want to fight or just want to, you know, own, own the conservatives, I'm not interested in it. The next one is, in light of your thesis, what gifts does orthodoxy have for resistance and what pitfalls? How should orthodox think about evangelization, nuns, duns, Protestants, Catholics, et al., in light of the culture's growing hostility to the faith? You know, we've had at our mission parish here in Baton Rouge over the COVID year, believe it or not, uh, more and more young people coming, young adults wanting to know what's going on with orthodoxy. And many of them say that they, they're coming out of Protestantism and they see that it's a lost cause there. And they believe that orthodoxy has the strength to stand. Um, I think that, uh, that one, one of the things I learned, and I wrote about this in the Benedict Option, is that orthodoxy has unique gifts that we have preserved for various historical reasons in ways that the Western church has not, ways that give us strength in this time. There was a guy, uh, Paul Connerton, a British social anthropologist who wrote an important little book a few years ago called How Societies Remember. He said that modernity dissolves all traditions, but there, that some small communities, not just religious communities but, uh, and societies manage somehow to hold on to their traditions in the midst of modernity. Well, so he set out to find out how they did it and he found that these communities had some things in common. First, they shared a sacred story, one that they all believed, told them who they are and what they're supposed to do. Second, they celebrated this sacred story in a communal ritual. Third, this ritual was understood to exist in some sense outside of time and to take the people who participated in it outside of time. And fourth, the ritual involved the body. It could not be something that just existed inside your head, but it required using all your senses to participate. You have to enact the truth of the sacred story with your body. Well, this is what we Orthodox do more than Protestantism and even more than modern Catholicism. This gives us a tremendous advantage, but none of this will do us any good if we only do it at a church and people can't see what we're doing. If Orthodoxy is just a Sunday, Sunday religion, not a way of life, it will fall. But I think what we have to do is start being uh, a lot more eager to invite people to church. I'm a terrible evangelist. I, I don't, I, I don't, I try not to be an apologist at all because I think I would be terrible at it. But um, I have found so many people over the years write me and say that just the fact that on my blog, I talk about orthodoxy, not in a way of trying to convince people to become Orthodox, but just talking about what it means to be Orthodox and telling people you need to go down to your local Orthodox parish and see what's going on. So many people find Christ in Orthodoxy simply because they had never heard of it before they saw it on my blog. Uh, I think this is one thing that all of us can do is make Orthodoxy more visible, you know, and uh, it's, it's a difficult thing to do because you don't want to be pushy and, and offensive. But at the same time, you know, just invite people. So many people are so lost and so down and frustrated and think that they have, they have Christianity figured out and it's not for them, but they, they've never heard of orthodoxy. Let's invite them over. Let's invite the nuns, the N-O-N-E-S over just to tell them no commitment, just come see what we do. I have found, and I think a lot of people who've converted have found that once you start going to an Orthodox church, there's something about it that stands in such distinction to the outside world. It is not a seeker-friendly church. It is a finder-friendly church. And the people who are serious about their faith are often real and are serious about the quest for faith are often 
really moved by that. We just need to tell more people about what we do and make that telling not just with words, but in the way we live. Rod, here's the next question. I think this one, not to put words in your mouth, may actually help you to explain the charge that the Benedict Option is um, directing us to sort of retreat from the world and become like in a little Amish community. And I know that's not what you're saying, but here's the question. Thank you for speaking to us today. Your argument reminds me of a type of crab which can kill itself through fear by remaining in its shell and refusing to go out into the world to eat. As Christians, we're called to love the world, turning our cheek even when slapped. Yet what you are endorsing sounds like a fearful retreat to weather the coming storm. How do we bear in mind this Kolakovich moment without giving up our mission to lighten the world? as a city set on a hill. How do you respond to the accusation of fear mongering? Well, Father Kolakovich was accused of this too, of fear mongering, you're just scaring people, but he had studied Soviet communism uh, and uh, as part of his academic work and he knew the communist mindset. It was not fear mongering if it really was going to happen. You know, and there is no, it is a, a form of despair to insist on being cheerful when things are serious. But I, the, as you say, Father Chad, the question brings to mind the whole idea of the Benedict option. People who never read the book often say, oh, you're just telling us to go head for the hills and hunker down. That's actually not true. What I'm saying, though, is that the faith that will be, will, that will be, make us resilient and help us to be faithful no matter what they throw at us it's a faith that, that is going to have to be cultivated by withdrawing somewhat from the world and, and into more and less intentional communities. What I mean by that is not picking up and moving to the woods, um, though people wanted to do that. I'm not necessarily going to, crit going to criticize them for it. What it means is doing things like, uh, like getting rid of the TV in your home or at least uh, getting rid of the uh, smartphones for your children and do, embracing things like uh, more prayer in the home, more study, things that strengthen the community, uh, things that, that make us, uh, draw us in closer in, uh, to what it means to live as Orthodox Christians, uh, and to help us to, when we go out into the world, as all of us must, we have to be able to bear the, be the icons of Christ and to bear the truth of Christ in that world, come what may. You know, I, I think about I think about this sort of thing uh, in the Benedict option. I think about Jeremiah twenty nine when God speaking to the prophet to his the people uh, of Israel in exile, he told them to settle down in in their new community and to take wives to pray for the peace of the community. They were not told to hide hide out, but we also have to keep in mind that God speaking to that same community in the book of Daniel gives us the the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the three Hebrew youth. These youth were completely embedded in Babylonian culture. They were servants of the king. But when the king demanded that they, uh, that they worship the false idol, they chose the prospect of death before apostasy. Now, we have to ask ourselves as Christians today, what was it about the way those Hebrew youth lived in their ordinary daily lives captive in Babylon that gave them the presence of mind and the strength of character to say, no, we're not going to capitulate. We are going to sacrifice our lives for the sake of our God. That's the kind of thing we need. There was something about life within the Hebrew community there in Babylon that formed that kind of man, and I, I presume that kind of woman. Uh, similarly with us, you know, if we are not being formed by constant repentance and catechesis and the, the liturgy of the sacraments, if we're not being formed in countercultural ways, then people, when we go out into the world, we're going to be crushed and people will not see Christ in us. That's the sort of thing I'm trying to convey to people. And I should also point out too, this is a good time to talk about the difference between optimism and hope. You know, people who say the things I'm talking about are scaring people. I tend to think those people are like optimists, people who don't want to think that bad things can actually happen to us. Well, that's just not true. We all hope that bad things won't happen to us, but you know, reality teaches us something different. I think that the difference between optimism and Christian hope is important here. Uh, someone who has Christian hope 
actually wants things to go well. Nobody wants bad things to happen. But a Christian knows that if things go badly, that if we share, if we accept it and we open ourselves up to suffer with Christ and through Christ, then the Lord can use this, this catastrophe for his own purposes, for our own salvation and for the redemption of the world. This is the, the idea that this man I mentioned earlier, Sylvester Kirchmeri, uh, took with him into the Czechoslovak gulag. The idea that he was never going to feel sorry for himself, that whatever bad thing was sent to him, he was going to receive it in a spirit of humility and, and inquiry as to how the Lord can use that for his salvation and to make him a better servant of others. If he had not been preparing himself, Dr. Kirchmeri, for years with prayer and scripture reading and, uh, and disciplines, he would not have been able to do that. I also would advise the questioner to go watch the film by Terrence Malick called A Hidden Life. It's based on the true story of the blessed Franz Jägerstader, uh, a, an Austrian Catholic farmer who lived high up in a mountain, uh, in the mountains of Austria near the German border, and uh, who died a martyr in, in Nazi prisons. Franz and his family, uh, they didn't think that Nazism would ever touch them there high up in their little tiny Alpine village, but it did come. And when it came to town, almost everybody in the town who went to church with Franz capitulated and accepted Nazism. But Franz and his family held out, even though they suffered greatly and ultimately he was killed. Why did they hold out? Because before Nazism came, Franz and his family had been living lives of engaged discipleship. They, because they had lived in such a way to bind themselves so closely to Christ in the life of the church, when the antichrist of Nazism showed up in their village, they knew what they were looking at, and faith in Christ gave them the, not only the, the sight to see the lie of Nazism, but it gave them the courage to say no, even at the expense of his life. They were living a kind of Benedict option, you know, in times of peace uh, so that prepared them to bear witness in times of hardship. And I think that's the sort of thing that we have to prepare for too. It's not fear, it's just being sensible. Thank you. Here's one more. Um, the seminar thanks you for the lecture and then ask this question. St. Ignatius of Antioch on his way to martyrdom writes in his letters that practices of spiritual asceticism can prepare us to bear witness resiliently and with boldness to our beliefs can you speak to this? You know, one of the things that, as an Orthodox Christian of, um, gosh, coming up on 15, 16 years now, that really makes Orthodoxy stand out it has been the seriousness with which Orthodoxy takes fasting. Nobody else does this anymore in the country, but Orthodoxy does. And it was so difficult for me when I first came in. But as you know, once you get into it and you do it with the community, it becomes less difficult. And uh, I think that the, the great gift of fasting for me as an Orthodox Christian has been to get used to the idea that, that we give up things, that we suffer, however mildly it is, that we can do that as a, way, as a form of spiritual discipline and as a form of asceticism that prepares us for the idea that sometimes sometimes we might have to give up some things, some greater things in a time of struggle. Uh, I, I gave a talk recently to a group, not a religious group, but these were political conservatives, young political conservatives who wanted me to talk about live not by lies and for what it might mean for them. A lot of them are Christian, but it wasn't a Christian group. And the, the host said, uh, so do you have any final advice for us? I said, yes. Everybody has to start preparing themselves to be able to suffer well. And he looked at me really funny and laughed and said, well, that's not a very, uh, a very cheerful or attractive slogan. I said, no, but it happens to be the truth that we, we will become much more susceptible to control uh, by people who do not wish us well if we are not prepared to suffer any kind of hardship, because uh, this, this is how soft totalitarianism will take over. If though the idea of asceticism has been woven into our daily consciousness and our daily practice as Christians, it will be easier to accept this hardship when we, serious hardship when we have to. I'll end by mentioning a story that really meant a lot to me. I put this in Live Not By Lies. When I was in Hungary doing interviews there, 
my translator is a young Hungarian Catholic woman, maybe 29, 30 years old, uh, married with a young child at home. And I, we were sitting on the tram and she's told me, she goes, Rod, I just don't understand my own generation. She said, even the few people, friends I have who still go to church, when I try to talk to them about the, the struggles I have with, um, you know, with my husband, or that we're fighting about something, or the, the frustrations I have with my little boy, the first thing they say is, oh, leave your husband, put your son in daycare, go back to work. You, you have to live for yourself. She said, I, I want to tell them, no, you don't understand. I love my husband. We have a good marriage. I love being at home with my son, but it's not always easy. She said, why can't people of my generation bear the least little bit of discomfort or anxiety without freaking out? And uh, I said, well, because they want a Christianity without tears. She said, where did you get that? Uh, and I said that they, they are, they, they, they're afraid of being unhappy and they want Christianity without tears. She said, where did you get that? I pulled out my phone and called up chapter 17 of Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. And this is the totalitarianism in Brave New World. It's a totalitarianism that controls people because everybody is afraid of losing pleasure. Everybody is so afraid of losing comfort that they surrender their political liberties for the sake of keeping comfort and pleasure there. It's unlike 1984, where in Orwell's novel, where the state controls people by inflicting them with fear and terror, rather to withdraw comfort is the most scary thing for the people in Brave New World. And I think this is the problem with us. You know, this is why so many of us will succumb to soft totalitarianism. It's not gonna be an Orwellian totalitarianism. It'll be more like Huxley, where people in their, their belief that they can't exist without, with the slightest discomfort or anxiety, they will accept anything to make that go away. Uh, people who have, have been discipled in a tradition of ordinary asceticism, as is normative orthodoxy, we will have be much better able, as St. Ignatius of Antioch said, to withstand this kind of pressure. The next question is, uh, what is your response to those who would say that these cultural changes we are experiencing isn't totalitarianism, but simply an evolving culture? In the 1950s, America, someone's job could have been threatened for advocating for something like same-sex marriage. Now the opposite is true. Yet it would be a large stretch to call the 1950s America totalitarian, albeit very restrictive. Why should we today, why should we call today's American totalitarian and not just restrictive? Well, that's a really good question. And um, totalitarianism, as I said, is most basically a system in which politics is controlled by one person or one party. And, and this is the key thing in which all aspects of life are politicized. And what's more, totalitarianism, when it goes all out, demands that it even control the nature of reality. Look, all societies require authority and the exercise of authority. 1950s America, you know, the, our, the America of the 2020s does that too. The, all societies have to draw lines. The difference is that a totalitarian society wishes to draw as many lines as is possible and rigidly enforce them. It wants to make it impossible for anybody to exist outside those narrowly drawn lines. In 1950s America, as authoritarian as it could be in some places, you could pick up and move to different communities or to parts of the country where you could, you were free to live counterculturally if you wanted. But under totalitarianism, this won't be possible. My fear is that, as I said earlier, is that we're developing, developing not only a totalitarian mentality, one that punishes any dissent or difference from the ruling ideology, but that we are also developing the technological infrastructure to make it impossible to escape that system. I mentioned China in the talk. In China, uh, it is almost entirely a cashless society. People do their business transactions on their laptops or on their smartphones. Now this makes things very convenient, but it also helps the state to know every single thing you buy. And it also gives the state the capability to make it where you can't buy or sell with the flip of a switch. Now, uh, this is something that will sound chilling to people who know the book of Revelation because they were, we were told that in the last days, people will not be able to, to buy or sell unless they have the mark of the beast. Now I'm not saying that China is the mark of the beast, but I'm saying that 
this kind of technology, the more we become cashless and the more we become integrated into the wired into the wider system, the more um, susceptible we are to totalitarian control. In the UK, um, some banks are refusing to give accounts to people who have been active on the far right. Now, some of these people are really nasty people. I've seen what they've done online, but think about that. Banks are not required to allow you to, to do business with them. What if every bank there is finds that you have been saying things online of which they don't approve and you can't get credit at a bank or even open an account? Where does that, where does that set you up you know, in, in society? Or what, you, will, you will ultimately conform. That's the kind of totalitarianism I'm talking about. And that sort of thing did not exist before because we did not have the technological capabilities. This will be the final question before we go to uh, our academic dean, Dr. Alex Tadoria. The question is, for better or for worse, social media has become our public square, and we have all become adapted to dehumanizing those who hold contradictory values. How do we balance the need for a perpetual forgiveness Sunday for our online sins with the need to speak the truth in love? Now that is a really complicated problem. Look, there, you know, I, I get... Uh, criticized by this a lot for being provocative online. Often I don't mean to be provocative, but we live in a culture uh, where that uh, internet culture does seem to have a payoff for being really provocative. And so I, I, I confess that I sin in that way all the time. And I, I appreciate, I, I honestly do appreciate being called on it because sometimes I don't even know what I'm doing. On the other hand, we live in a culture in which people will claim that they have, and very sincerely, that they've suffered grave harm if they hear an opinion that they don't like. Right, right now at Baylor University, the Baptist University of Texas, there's a, a, student, uh, a student group that's trying to get this professor there canceled, to get her fired by the university because she disagrees with the idea that, um, that transgendered women, as to say biological men who present as women, are really women. They, they claim the group that's trying to get her fired is, uh, claims that they've suffered grave harm and they don't feel safe because of this. This is a standard strategy to silence dissent by claiming that words actually cause concrete harm in that way. Uh, you can, if, if you say something online, and this has happened to me, you say simply that I don't believe that people should be discriminated against on the basis of race, that everybody should be treated equally regardless of their race. There's some people on the left who will accuse you of being a white supremacist. I mean, there's, so there's no way to avoid offending everybody. Uh, and we, we can't bow down to this sort of craziness to give the most sensitive person in the room a veto power over what we say. But Again, uh, there, there's certainly, it's certainly true that people say things on the internet that are, don't need to be said. I've said them myself. I do say them myself. And this is something that we need to watch out for. I found that a good rule of thumb is to imagine before you say something on the internet, imagine that the person you're speaking to or the persons you're speaking to are sitting there in the room with you on the couch. Would you say it? That would you say the things you're going to say, or would you say the things you're going to say in the way that you are prepared to say them? Uh, in my case, I never participate in orthodox discussions online because they tend to be dominated by people who are extremists on either the left or the right. And there, these, these conversations are almost always all heat and no light. Now, when I was a Catholic, before I became orthodox, I allowed myself to go down that path, and it was very destructive to my faith. When I first became Orthodox, I started to go down that path again, and it blew up in my face. I learned a lesson. Maybe some people can handle that. I can't handle it. It's destructive to my faith, so I stay away from it. And I would suggest to everyone listening that if you're that sort of person, if you find yourself fighting a lot online, maybe it's leading you into a place that you shouldn't be. I, I tend to, I think a lot of people who fight online tend to be young men who um, are passionate about things like I've been passionate about things, but they often don't see that that combativeness uh, turns people away from the faith and also turns their own hearts without them even realizing it towards a, a kind of, uh, uh, towards like, I, and I'm orthodox and I'm angry about it sort of mentality. And that's not good either. 
Again, Rod, our, our very deep thanks. Um, we'll now go to uh, our, our academic dean, Dr. Alex Doria. Thank you, Father Chad. Uh, it's not very easy for me to talk at the end of this uh, uh, lecture and uh, the Q&A session, but I do have some uh, dots to connect. Obviously, uh, my history, I was spending 15 years uh, of my life in a communist country uh, in a, under the communist regime. So I know a few things and I resonate with several things that uh, Rod mentioned. Uh, I will start with, uh, or I will start stating that uh, being trained as a medievalist, I was not having my eye on the communist or 20th century uh, uh, all the time, but I was always thinking that uh, it's something important to uh, study that period of time. And I, I would definitely uh, go back and, and check several things related to either pre-communist or uh, communist in Romania in particular, or Eastern uh, countries, Eastern Europe countries. Um, my first thought is uh, somehow connected to your, uh, your uh, quotation from Ogorodnikov. Uh, I was celebrated young pioneer myself. Uh, it was a code of honor. It was a, a colored code. I remember the day when I received the uh, blue ribbon being the representative of the whole pioneers in one unit. And, you know, uh, now just looking back to that, I, I, I just realized, you know, how, how not, not young and foolish I was, but it was just the whole story that was delivered to uh, anyone at the young age, uh, seven years old, 10 years old, 14 years old, uh, everybody it was in that system. And that was the, the purpose of uh, your life if you did not have something else. Fortunately, uh, in my case, it was something else because although it was a communist regime, Romania, it was uh, really, let's say a kind of a relaxed when it comes to the church. Uh, now looking back, there were so many historians talking about the collaborationism of Romanian Orthodox Church and so on. But I can tell you, and now I'm moving to the second dot that is uh, uh, Kolakovic. There were so many Kolakovich uh, or Kolakovich-like profiles in, in Romania in the 80s. And I was happened to uh, connect and uh, be close to so many of them. And they were working uh, against the regime. Uh, some of them, you know, uh, with a little bit more power and a little bit more tough words than the other, but all of them, they were actually building the faith all of them, they were at the grassroots working together against the regime and uh, building the Romanian Orthodox Church. And uh, I am pretty sure that my other two colleagues that had the similar experience, it, by the grace of God here at St. Vladimir's, we have three professors spending at least uh, 15 years in different communist regimes. Dr. Pemiakov in USSR, in the Baltics and Father Bogdan Bukur uh, as myself in, in Romania. Um, and uh, I'm pretty sure they, they encounter in their lives uh, before the fall of communism, all sorts of uh, Kolakovic-like priests. Uh, then moving forward, I, I just want to connect that with, uh, with the volume that Father Chad mentioned at the beginning, uh, and uh, our beloved uh, former Dean, Father Alexander Schmemann. Again, from my experience in uh, Romania, uh, in communist Romania, I remember those evenings when we were listening to Radio Free Europe and Voice of America. Uh, I do not recall exactly, you know, the voices of those dissidents that were representing the church. It was much more into politics and sports and so on. But there were two, and both of them are connected with New York area. Both of them uh, are pretty famous here in the U.S., Father Vasile Vasilaki and Father Gheorghe Calci Dumitrasa. They were 
pretty consistent with their voices, at least at, uh, at the radio uh, Voice of America. And uh, it, it's difficult for me to remember their voices uh, since I was not you know, really paying attention to these kind of details, much more attractive it was for me to follow those uh, brave uh, sportsmen that were you know, escaping the uh, iron curtain and they were just going to enjoy freedom somewhere in Germany, United States or the UK. But still those voices now looking back were so prominent and they were again building with the uh, inside the uh, Kolakovich like priests, they were building the faith in, in uh, uh, the communist regimes. Um, this is exactly what Father Alexander and uh, Alexander Schmemann from here was trying to do for the USSR uh, uh, situation. Then I would move to one of uh, your quotation in, in your book, in your recent book, uh, coming from the Slovak, uh, Timo uh, Krička. Uh, I like that very much and uh, definitely for our seminarians, they, they might connect this idea that I'm going to uh, to cite uh, with the uh, with the homily this morning, uh, you mentioned. I, I was particularly touched by by that. You mentioned that an inside voice by by Timo uh, that you find to be subtle and immensely important is that the greatest totalitarian ruler is neither the totalitarian communist regime nor the progressive liberal state but one's own self, and that a true revolution is a revolution against the tyranny of the self. This is definitely uh, you know, the answer for everything, for all the questions. Christ is the answer. Uh, the community and the, uh, in the church and the sacraments, this is the answer, the, the final answer. And uh, my call this morning for uh, a life in the eschaton, Although here, you know, in the uh, imminent history that we are living in is to me the right answer. Um, at the end, I would just simply extend my thanks in the name of this institution to our guest speaker, Rod Rare, uh, to our beloved seminarians upstairs in, uh, in Medfield. They were uh, looking to us and uh, thank you for your patience and uh, for your devotion and of course to our hundreds of virtual friends. Thank you so much for uh, a very nice uh, afternoon.